Hi everyone and welcome to the annual WACOS State Budget Briefing. My name is Jenny Gray and I'm the Deputy CEO here at WACOS. Um, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the Aboriginal custodians on the respective land in which we're meeting today. For us here at WACOS, it's the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to recognise um, the resilience and wisdom of Aboriginal people and communities whose ongoing connection to culture is the oldest in human civilisation. So this way cost budget briefing is different for lots of reasons. We are recovering from the biggest health shocks, social and economic included, that any of us have experienced. We are hot on the heels of a federal budget where the emphasis was on hard hats, not the hard hit, to paraphrase the Grattan Institute. And it's spring, not autumn. Cameron, not Gerard. And we are joined with presentations from our colleagues in the Western Australian Department of Treasury and Bank West Curtin Economic Centre, which we are especially pleased about. Treasury will begin with an overview of the WA budget for us, with a focus for recovery and key issues for vulnerable people and the services that support them. Then the team at Bankwest will provide some high level analysis of the federal and state budgets, looking at some of the key assumptions and projections about the future of our economy and labour market, including with a gender lens. And then WACOS will highlight some of the key issues and, uh, and announcements for the community services in the federal and state budgets. What's new, what's important, important and where are the gaps? So as you can see, we're in a webinar format today rather than a Zoom call. This means that we'll take questions through the chat function. And there'll be a few minutes to do that after each presentation, plus a bit more time for questions and conversations with the panel at the end. So, first up, the Michaels, Barnes and Andrews from Treasury. Michael Barnes is the under treasurer the Principal Economic and Financial Advisor to the State Government, having statutory responsibility around the management and reporting of the state's finances, including the budget. Michael Andrews is the Acting Executive Director of Strategic Policy and Evaluation, overseeing most of the general government spending in WA and responsible for achieving value for money outcomes through his team's financial and social policy advice to departments. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Jenny. Uh, we'll just wait for the slides to come up. Um, so in true Treasury fashion, we've got a heap of uh, charts to get through, so I'll try and whip through them quickly and uh, maximise the time for questions at the end. So if we can go to the next slide. So just in summary, um, at the core of this budget is the uh, recovery plan that the government announced back in July. Um, the recovery plan is very significant. It contains over 500 individual initiatives um, across the state in every region, um, a whole raft of uh, initiatives, which I won't go through in detail, but this budget uh, fully funds that $5.5 billion recovery plan. Other key initiatives in the budget um, include the uh, $600 electricity credit that was announced on the weekend, um, an additional 800 police officers to be recruited over the next four years, also a very significant focus um, on mental health and remote Aboriginal communities in this budget. Um, and importantly, uh, given the circumstances we found ourselves in, um, the government really had no choice but to recalibrate its fiscal strategy in this budget. Um, prior to COVID, the government's clear focus was on uh, reducing debt and um, we were starting to make good inroads into reducing that debt trajectory. Um, with COVID, government had to change that strategy um, and really focus on the recovery and on jobs, major focus on getting jobs back. Um, and that has necessitated a change in fiscal strategy and um, quite a sharp increase in net debt since the mid-year review, up, up over $8 billion uh, since December's mid-year review. Uh, next slide, please. So look, just to illustrate, I think this is probably my favourite chart, which is a bit perverse, but it's just spectacular. Um, so this shows household consumption in WA. Household consumption is the largest component of the economy. It's about 41% of the economy. 
Um, and you can see here in the June quarter, so this was at the height of the, of the COVID restrictions. Um, in the June quarter, household consumption just absolutely crashed um, by over 10% just in that quarter. And being the largest component of the economy, that resulted in the overall domestic economy uh, contracting by 6% in that quarter. And that too was the largest ever contraction in the, in the WA uh, economy. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so that table there on the left, you can see the 6% contraction in what's called state final demand. It's a measure of the domestic economy um, in the June quarter. But notwithstanding that, we had pretty good growth momentum in the lead up to COVID. Um, so that resulted in actual positive growth uh, over the full 2019-20 year of 1.1% in WA. As you can see there, we were the only state to have recorded positive growth over the year. That positive growth reflected um, a couple of things. One is the fact that we were able to get on top of the virus quickly and contain its spread. The other one was um, the first increase we saw in business investment in seven years in WA. And that in turn relates to the structure of WA's economy, which is fundamentally different from the national economy. And that's reflected in the chart on the right. So our mining industry is obviously very dominant here. It accounts for about a third of the state's economy. It accounts for about two thirds of business investment. So that first increase in business investment in seven years was really driven by the mining sector and particularly by uh, the large iron ore miners. Um, so that's held us in, in pretty good stead uh, in comparison to the other states. We go to the next slide. Um, consumer and business confidence. So in this sort of um, pandemic environment, confidence is everything. If consumers and businesses don't have confidence, they're not going to spend. Um, you can see on both charts, um, both consumer and business confidence took a massive dive um, when COVID hit and at the height of the restrictions. Um, but in WA at least, they've both bounced back. And in fact, they've both bounced back into positive territory now, the most recent readings. So both consumer and business confidence now back in positive territory and uh, comfortably above the, the, the national uh, confidence levels. So that's a really good sign, and that is supporting uh, both business spending and retail trade in WA. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so probably the, the most severe impact uh, of COVID and those restrictions uh, back in the June quarter was really felt in the labour market. Um, between the three months of February to May, we saw 103,000 jobs lost in WA in that three month period, which is quite extraordinary. And to put that in context, over the preceding three and a half years, about 77,000 jobs were created. So that was more than wiped out in the space of three months. Um, since then though, so since, uh, well from June onwards, we've had quite a rapid recovery in jobs and to be honest, much more rapid than we had, we had thought. So we've since recovered about 71% of that initial loss in jobs. Um, and females are starting to catch up to males. So the, the recovery in female jobs is, is about 66%. The recovery in male jobs about 77%. All up, 71% of the lost jobs have been recovered. Um, the area that still worries us a little bit is, uh, is youth. Youth unemployment remains very high. Um, and we've only recovered about a third of the initial loss in, um, in youth employment. So a heavy focus on the recovery plan and in the Commonwealth budget uh, is on youth employment, youth training, apprenticeships, traineeships. Um, we're going to have to watch that space pretty closely for a while, I think. The chart on the right there shows um, internet vacancies. So they're a leading indicator of uh, demand for employment, uh, demand for labour. So you can see there, again, they dived dramatically, but have since recovered very, very quickly. Um, and in fact, back to levels above pre-COVID, which is um, quite extraordinary. Uh, next slide, please. So we took a big, big hit in the June quarter. We're recovering quite uh, solidly from that now um, and, and more quickly than, than Treasury had originally uh, envisaged, to be honest. But look, the economy has still taken a hit and uh, that, that hit's going to last for a while. Um, so the chart there on the left is gross state product. That's the overall measure of the state's economy, including net exports. 
At mid-year review time back in December, we were forecasting the economy would grow by 2.5% in this current year. Uh, that's now been revised down to 1.25%. And um, you can see the, the subsequent years there. That's well below the long-run average rate of growth, but it's still positive growth. And compared to what we were looking at back in April or May, that's a big turnaround. Um, and I suspect that when all the other states bring down their budgets you know, by the end of November, um, we'll probably be the only state recording positive growth uh, in 2021. Queensland maybe, um, but the others I suspect will be, um, will be forecasting uh, contractions. Unemployment obviously has taken um, a hit. That's the chart on the right. Uh, so you can see there we have substantially revised up our unemployment forecasts. So for this current year, 2021, um, we're forecasting an average unemployment rate of 8% over the year. Um, the latest data from the ABS, which was for August, showed an unemployment rate of 7% for WA. So the August results were incredibly positive, much more positive than we were expecting. And that drove the unemployment rate down to 7%. But we're going to see a lot of volatility going forward in the unemployment rate. Um, one of the reasons for that is there's quite a divergence between the number of people on JobSeeker in WA, which is about 172,000, and the number of officially unemployed people, which is about 102,000. And that reflects the fact that um, up until now, uh, people on JobSeeker during the COVID period did not have to actively search for a job. So the Commonwealth temporarily waived that requirement for job seeker recipients. But as of the end of September, uh, that mutual obligation has been reinstated. So job seekers are going to have to, once again, start um, actively searching for work. So those who uh, can't find a job will uh, become officially unemployed. Um, and I suspect that will put a bit of upward pressure on the unemployment rate uh, in months to come. But it will remain volatile and we'll just keep a close eye on it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's clearly elevated risks and elevated uncertainty in the current economic environment. Trying to forecast in this environment, frankly, is unbelievably difficult. And there's so much noise in the data and so much uncertainty about the future trajectory. Um, but the single biggest risk to our economic outlook is the prospect of, and let's say it never happens, but the prospect of um, a second outbreak of COVID in, in the WA community. So we modelled um, a scenario whereby we have a second outbreak and whereby we lock everything down, short, sharp, six weeks. What does a six week lockdown look like? Um, and it is just a scenario, but it's to illustrate that risk that I'm talking about. And as you can see here, that scenario, so a short, sharp, six-week scenario, and this assumes that the mining industry carries on pretty much uninterrupted. So this is really talking about the cons effectively consumption. Um, this would see, under that scenario, about a $5.5 billion reduction in the domestic economy and a loss of over 30,000 jobs. So stating the obvious, I guess, but that shows how important it is just to keep the forest out of the, out of the community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our revenue has taken a hit as well, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. So uh, these charts, payroll tax and transfer duty, so property uh, stamp duty, they're our two largest sources of uh, tax revenue. We've revised both of those down significantly since the mid-year review in December um, by about $2 billion in total uh, between the two of them. Uh, next one, please. And similarly with uh, GST grants, so uh, even though we've got the GST reforms uh, in place a couple of years ago and they've been very beneficial to WA, we're still affected, like everyone, every other state, um, by reductions in the size of the national GST pool. And obviously the national GST pool has been heavily impacted by reduced consumption um, in all states. Um, and you can see the impact of that on this chart. So we've revised down WA's GST grants by about $2.7 billion since our mid-year review expectations. And that's been impacted, for example, by the extended lockdown in Victoria. So Victoria's a quarter of the national economy. If they can't go out and spend, that's going to impact the national GST pool, and that in turn impacts every other state, including WA. Uh, next slide. 
Um, the one bit of good news on the revenue front for WA, and this is where we're very different to the other states, is our royalties and particularly our iron ore royalties. So these account for about 20% of the state's revenue base. And you can see here the iron ore price has really taken off. Um, it's about double its long run average at the moment. Um, we weren't really expecting that. That reflects a couple of things, um, predominantly the, the demand we've got from China. So China was clearly the first country hit by COVID. They locked down hard in the March quarter and they rebounded very sharply in the June quarter. So they grew by 10% in the June quarter. And that timing has just worked out beautifully for us. Um, so their demand for steel, as they stimulate their economy with basically construction, the demand for steel and hence iron ore has, um, has really picked up. That's lifted the iron ore price. And then um, uh, poor old Brazil's having trouble getting, getting its iron ore uh, shipped off to China. So both the demand and the supply side are, are helping the iron ore price and that's helping our revenues. Um, we don't expect that situation to last long though. And the budget is based on an assumption that the iron ore price will fall uh, back to its long run average uh, by June next year, as you can see on the chart on the right. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the, the numbers, the fiscal numbers underpinning the budget. Um, I won't go through those in detail here, but I just wanted to highlight one thing or two things. Um, in the middle of that table, there's a line called expense growth. We're looking at 8% expense growth um, in 2021. That's about a uh, $2.4 billion increase in recurrent expenditure. So the day-to-day -day you know, cost of running government. Um, and then down the bottom, the second last line, uh, the asset investment program. So that's our, our capital expenditure, building new infrastructure. Um, you can see there that from 1920 to 2021, we're also looking at about a $2.4 billion year on year increase. So between our recurrent expenditure and our capital expenditure, we're budgeting for a, um, a $4.8 billion year on year increase in spending. Um, that's, that's a huge increase in, in the level of fiscal support uh, that the state government's providing. Uh, next slide, please. So with, um, with that increase in recurrent spending um, and with the reduction in our revenue base that I went through earlier, our operating surpluses, and we're still in operating surplus, but our operating surpluses have been revised down substantially uh, since mid-year review by a total of $6.6 .6 billion over four years. So that's a big hit, um, but uh, we've managed to stay in a, 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 an operating surplus position. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just want to make this distinction because people don't really understand it well. Um, the state government's probably copped a bit of criticism in the last day or two for still being in a surplus budget position at, you know, at this time. Um, and some of that criticism has come from the Commonwealth government as well. The Commonwealth budgets on a different basis to all of the states. So all of the states have as their headline budget measure this thing called the operating balance. And using that operating balance, we're in a surplus position. And the operating balance just takes account of the day-to-day -day recurrent operating expenditure of government. It doesn't take account of infrastructure investment. When you take account of that infrastructure investment, including the infrastructure investment done by our government trading enterprises, like the ports, uh, Western Power, um, Water Corporation, you can see on this chart that we're actually in a substantial cash deficit position in 2021. Um, about a $3.4 billion cash deficit. And that's a marked turnaround from the cash surplus we had in 1920. So that chart there, I think, illustrates better than any other the degree of fiscal support uh, for the economy that the state government is providing in this current financial year. And if we budgeted on the same basis as the Commonwealth, uh, that's what we'd be showing. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of our infrastructure investment, this is a major focus of the budget. Um, we've got hundreds and hundreds of infrastructure projects across the state. Um, a big ramp up uh, in our level of investment in this current financial year. So you can see on the chart on the left, we're looking at almost a 50% increase in our infrastructure spend this year compared to last year. Um, and the chart on the right shows you the uh, breakup of that. Um, 
and clearly the major uh, area of investment over the next four years is in, in roads um, and rail, rail predominantly being Metronet. So roads and rail account for about 43% of our total infrastructure spend over the next four years. Uh, next slide, please. So with that reduction in our revenue, um, the increase in our recurrent expenditure to help deal with COVID and that big step up in our infrastructure investment to help stimulate jobs, um, our net debt trajectory has completely turned around. So the dotted line there, um, is our mid-year review, was our mid-year review forecast where we had net debt projected to decline. Um, we're now uh, expecting net debt to continue increasing over the forward estimates um, and to reach 42.8 billion by the end of the forward estimates. Uh, that second last year there, you can see um, the difference between the dotted line and the bar, um, that's the $8.3 billion increase in net debt since mid-year review. So um, substantial increase. Uh, next slide, please. Household fees and charges, so um, providing support for households, uh, another significant area of focus in this budget. Um, a total of over $1 billion in, in support for households. Uh, the big ticket item is the $600 electricity credit uh, for all households that will start rolling out from the 1st of November. Takes about uh, two months with the billing cycle for that to roll out in, in total. Um, that is in addition, so that has about a $650 million cost, that credit. Uh, that is in addition to the freeze in all household fees and charges that was announced earlier this year um, in response to COVID. Um, so when you add those two things together, the, the average household is looking at about a 10% reduction uh, in its total household bills this year compared to last year. Um, and as you can see on that chart, that's the first reduction uh, we've had in the household bills for uh, 15 years. Um, the last point there about energy assistance payment recipients, there's about 300,000 households on concession cards who also receive the energy assistance payment. Uh, that payment, which uh, was $305, was uh, doubled in 2021, uh, so $610. So people who are in receipt of the EAP um, this year will be receiving total assistance of uh, over $1,200. Next slide, please. Um, so in addition to all of those uh, financial measures, I guess, there's, there's a bunch of regulatory measures as well. Um, so the residential tenancy protections, which were put in place uh, earlier this year, and originally for six months, um, they've been extended for another six months through to the end of March next year. So that includes a, a, a moratorium on most evictions, um, no rent increases, automatic conversion of fixed term tenancies to periodic tenancies during that emergency period and a mandatory uh, conciliation process. So I think that's been a, a, a pretty key intervention uh, by the state government during the, the emergency period. Um, at the same time, the uh, electricity disconnection moratorium has also been extended. Uh, that went through to the end of June next year. And also with respect to water charges, um, households who are having trouble paying their water charges with, due to financial difficulty due to COVID um, will, will not have their water supply restricted in any way and will not have interest charged on their deferred uh, water bill payments. Now, next slide, please. So I think at this point, I was gonna hand over to Mike to uh, quickly finish off the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, look, I've seen your message, Chris, and I know that we are getting very close to time. And um, uh, given the fact that you have put together a whole number of fact sheets for um, for your membership, I, I'll, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, as Mike was already touched on, um, the budget obviously brings to book the $5.5 billion um, recovery plan that was announced in July. Um, the focus really is around um, delivery going forward. And, uh, and in doing so, the government has put in place um, the infrastructure delivery unit in finance and uh, the, the program management office in the department of um, at DPC. Um, the, the key focus here is partnering with, with industry, with the sector, um, ensuring that we're delivering um, what, uh, what government has uh, sort of announced back in July and making sure that we sequence that in a way that's achievable um, and, and ensuring that we're paying a, a, the, the right emphasis to um, regional WA, Aboriginal communities, women and youth. Um, next slide. 
I am going to race through this, so <laughs> thanks. Uh, so um, you'd be well aware of uh, of the uh, the outcomes of the budget. I mean, a lot of this stuff was already out there and announced um, prior to, to yesterday. Um, but just wanted to touch on um, the 32 million um, to support victims, family, and, and domestic violence. Um, this budget um, goes some step further around the government's investment around domestic violence. Um, this is touching on obviously the outreach services around the metro and regional WA. Um, strengthens the response teams, um, particularly um, when they partner with, with WA police with call outs. Um, there's also some uh, infrastructure investment around that bed capacity at um, the, the new refuges that are being built out at Peel and, um, and Quinana. Um, and I think the the other thing I'd, I'd bring to your attention is around the the government's recently um, sort of enacted FDV legislation, um, and, and primarily around making it easier for victims to get VROs, and also when they are dealing with um, uh, I guess their situation in court, that the um, the introduction of a shuttle conferencing um, regime, whereby it protects the, vic the victim from having to, to face their perpetrator. Um, to, a good little investment. Um, next slide. Um, I'll, I'll actually just jump down to the bottom of this one and, and, and just focus in on, on government's um, $320 million investment in, in social housing. Um, this is uh, this has been really handy in the sense that it uh, you know, gives, a, gives a, the boost of over the next 12 months um, um, around dealing with housing stock. Um, this particular initiative um, sort of looks at not only building new houses, you know, up to 250 new social housing um, uh, dwellings, uh, but also um, making making sure that we're um, doing some work around the um, the refurbishment of about 1,500 um, houses, which which inevitably would have fallen off um, the housing stock. So that's uh, uh, that's well in, in train and um, will be delivered over the next um, 12 to 24 months. Um, next slide. Uh, police officers, I guess that was obviously one of the uh, one of the big announcements yesterday. Um, 800 um, additional police officers which will be rolled out over the next four years. Um, it, it's also recognised, I touched on earlier um, a few slides ago around the the need to, to partner with the police with, with other uh, first responders, particularly in mental health and um, community officers that are, that are dealing with um, family and domestic violence. So the, um, I guess that, that relationship between police and other um, frontline agencies um, will, will be strengthened by, by this increase. And uh, I guess the, um, the other thing that, that I'd point out with, with police is that um, We've also, for the first time, um, been, a, all, been able to fund the, the flow-on impacts by, by adding 800 police officers to the system. So there's, a, there's an additional $57 million that will, that will flow to both the Department of Justice, um, Legal Aid and, and the Office of or the DPP to ensure that we don't then have a, a system that, um, that is clogged up um, with um, I guess additional um, matters that, that come before the court. Thanks, you're moving me on now. I don't even have to uh, ask you to, to press the next button. Um, mental health, um, so there is, the government's well aware of the mental health situation in, in Western Australia. Um, this is, I guess, the first steps of the government investing in, a, um, I guess, 306 odd million dollars um, across, um, across the Ford estimates to deal with, you know, both, both acute um, hospital settings and, and uh, taking those first, I guess, those steps into the community settings. Um, it's not to say that there isn't more to be done, but um, it is obviously the first steps. Uh, disability services, sorry, next slide. So what government has done here is obviously announced $237 odd million, which is basically putting into the budget over the Ford estimates that continuation of, of state administered disability services. Um, government's well aware that not, not everyone will, um, will be uh, I guess applicable under the NDIS scheme as we as we continue that transition, and really this is putting in the uh, I guess the required funding to to deal with um, frontline services for people that don't uh, don't qualify. Um, this isn't a, a set and forget; um, it'll be obviously monitored over time, and um, 
we'll continue to, to watch this really closely as, um, as transition and full scale becomes um, closer. Um, next slide. Some other, uh, other key initiatives out of the, out of the budget, um, the remote Aboriginal communities, so with uh, the, the federal government uh, pulling out of their funding in terms of remote communities. Um, this is the, this is the first opportunity the state's had uh, to inject, uh, I guess, a, an amount of money to the tune of $200 million, um, really to address that, those essential services that are required on an ongoing basis um, within remote communities in Western Australia. Um, the government's also invested in two um, Aboriginal short-stay facilities to be built in Kununurra and Geraldton. And there's also $10 million to Aboriginal youth wellbeing in the, um, in the Kimberley um, to deal with the, um, I guess, the, the uh, sorry, the coroner's report that was done around um, suicides in, in, the, um, in the Kimberley. Um, so next slide. All right, well, look, we won't read out that. People can, uh, people can read that for themselves and maybe just go straight to questions. Yeah, good, great. Thank you very much, Michael and Michael. We, it's really uh, fantastic to see that level of detail. And again, we're very appreciative of um, your making time to join us and the sector um, today. We possibly haven't got time for questions. We have got a few in the chat. Um, there is one question in particular that you might be able to answer quickly. Mary Jane has asked, is there a summary of where we can see the comparative spends across departments between years? Is there somewhere in the budget that that's easily located? Not really. <laughs> Probably not. If you want a bit of a time series, but look, we can, we can, we can pull something together. Oh, great. Fantastic. So perhaps what we can do, we do know that you have to leave. Is it possible that we um, send you these questions that we're collecting in the chat? and you answer what you can, and we can share them with the participants on the webinar? Yeah, sure. Yeah, not a problem Oh, fantastic. Yep. Well, maybe we'll do that and keep moving on. Okay. Thank you again. We really appreciate that. Fantastic. Okay. No worries. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. Have a weekend. Thank you. Yes. Okay, next up, our friends, Professor Alan Duncan and Associate Professor Rebecca Cassells from Bank West Curtin Economic Centre, an organisation well known for undertaking independent economic and social research. So Alan is a director of the centre and also Bank West Professor of Economic Policy at Curtin University. And um, Rebecca is a deputy director and Rebecca also oversees the Gender Equity Insights series. So over to you, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, we're gonna to flick through, I think, um, our uh, presentation a little bit faster. Um, really what we're going to try and do today is hone in on two particular measures that uh, impact households and get down to sort of a micro level and look at the distributional impacts and also the gendered impacts of those um, those initiatives, um, including the, the Western Australian uh, government uh, support for households in terms of the, the electricity subsidy and, and um, household fees and services um, costs relief there, but also um, going to the federal government's tax and, and uh, transfer system changes that they um, have implemented and are going to implement going forward. So if we just move to the next slide, Chris, I'll just go with a, 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 just a bit of a, a summary, which you really heard from um, Michael and Michael um, just before. Our, our take on the Western Australian economy, you know, at the moment is that it is very different to national economy. The outlook is incredibly positive compared to the rest of Australia. Um, having um, COVID kept out of the, the, um, the state, but also the economy has meant that activity can, could resume largely um, as normal, but obviously there's some, some issues in, in certain sectors. Uh, people are spending, they're buying houses, there's stimulus in that sector. They're actually traveling um, within the state so that domestic travel is substituting for inter international uh, travel and jobs are recovering. And I won't go into the details of that job recovery because Michael's already talked about that. But I will say that women are not regaining employment at the same rate as men. Um, that there's about two, women have recovered about two thirds of jobs um, since February that were lost and men around um, 70, 70 plus percent. So um, there's still some more work to do, especially for women's um, workforce uh, uh, outcomes. 
and um, particularly for their participation as well. So they, they've actually dropped out of the labour market at a higher sort of rate than men. Um, we're seeing some different problems here in Western Australia and a couple of those are labour shortages and labour mismatches and they're actually likely to become more of an issue in the weeks and months ahead. So if we move to the um, next slide and then the next slide again, Chris, so I won't show the chart. So two slides in. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll head to the next one. Um, that's really just looking at the jobs recovery. And one of the things we've been thinking about really are what, what are the problems that we see up ahead? And, and that's been already identified by the Treasury um, representatives in their um, presentation earlier. And that's the impact of the changes to job seeker and job keeper. So lifting um, th that reduction in the rates of both of them and then eventually them coming to an end, particularly job seeker at the end of December and then um, job keeper at the end of March. So there's, and there's also other house of households Policies that are going to be wound back. So, it's very likely that at the moment, both of these policies, job seeker and job keeper, are actually driving a lot of the expenditure that we're seeing in the, in, in the economy at the moment, particularly in WA. We're seeing um, spending patterns of low income households are often, they don't save, but they spend. But we are seeing other sort of higher income, medium income households, they, they tend to save. So, we think that job seeker, job keeper are actually driving economic activity and that's an important point to, to understand. So unwinding these payments without any sort of sufficient income substitute, a, a sufficient job or sufficient supplement, a permanent supplement to job seeker, it's going to mean two things and the first is that consumption is going to fall and that impacts the whole of the economy and the second is that more households are going to start to experience cost of living pressures and that that means financial stress that means psychological stress that means relationship stress and, and as you would all know the list goes on and on we also see that quality of jobs is going to it has been um, an ongoing issue and it's going to remain an ongoing issue people getting sufficient hours sufficient pay and the and job security that which was um, really decreasing since the global financial crisis and particularly for men, but also for women as well. And women always have a higher rate of a job insecurity in the labour market relative to men anyway. So we need to make sure that especially the hiring credit that's being introduced by the federal government um, is going to deliver quality jobs and skills for young people and they're not left with a debt at the end of it and insufficient hours or pay. So I think I'm gonna hand to Alan now, or, I might, or there might be one more slide that I'm going to talk to actually, which is just, now um, that's just the retail turnover. We'll move to the next one, Chris. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into deep here around the two um, the two policy initiatives that I just I talked about at the start. The obviously the six hundred dollar electricity credit credit. It's a it's a it's a significant um, uh, spending stimulus and assistance um, for WA households. Uh, WA government doesn't have a lot of levers to pull when it comes to actually giving cash stimulus directly to households. So it's a good initiative, we think. Um, and for vulnerable households in particular, combined with the EAP, and that should say 610 rather than 605, that's actually going to see um, 300,000 households, as I understand it, better off by $1,200 uh, a, a year. So that's a significant help for these households with what can be really um, quite um, quite, a, quite a large bill that they have to pay. Um, so combined with federal supports, we think that, um, that this will be like an important to a temporary cost of living pressure for thousands of households. And it's also going to provide an important um, boost to aggregate demand. And Alan's going to um, go into a little bit more detail about that payment, um, but also then move to looking at the changes in the income and the, uh, in, in the tax, uh, income tax and also the, the benefit system. Um, Chris, next slide, thank you. Uh, so just to put in context the, um, the, the, the scale of the benefits uh, coming through the household electricity credit, um, this slide just shows um, the application of a typical level of household uh, energy consumption uh, and values that consumption on the basis of an A1 home plan tariff. Um, if you use a sort of typical consumption, daily consumption of 50 um, uh, kilowatts per, per hour, then that translates to an annual spend of just under $2,000. So that will be a typical spend on the basis of the consumption patterns that you, um, uh, that you see there as an, uh, as an illustration. Next slide, Chris. But in actual fact, a typical household is a very rare thing. 
there are many different circumstances a household's face, which means that the actual spending on, um, uh, on uh, utilities, uh, including energy, uh, are you know, far, far more broad and varied. If you take, for example, um, uh, a single parent uh, family with kids, um, whilst the typical spend in term uh, uh, expressed as a share of total expenditure is around four and a half percent of the total budget expressed by the, the vertical bar in the center of that box, you can see that the spread of uh, spending shares on utilities is really very broad. 25% um, of households actually spend more uh, amongst single parent households. They spend more than 10% of their household budget on energy. So in that context, the, uh, the commitment to, um, uh, to support the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, energy costs through this credit is a, is a really sort of valuable thing. Next slide, Chris, and next slide again. So uh, as Beck said, we also wanted to just run through some very fresh analysis that BCC has conducted to try and look at the aggregate uh, impact of the uh, federal budget um, uh, 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 measures announced on Tuesday. Um, and so we do so by, uh, by effectively analyzing how um, these measures impact a broad cross-section of uh, households, taking into account both the bring, bringing forward of the personal tax plan, stage two, to 2021, um, the job seeker COVID supplement, which is in play for um, part of 2021, but is removed from January of 2021, uh, as well as the bonus payments, including the $500 payment to pensioners, carers, and those on DSP. So our assessment looks at the distributional impact of these measures combined, both in the next year, financial year, 2021, uh, 2020 to 21, and the subsequent year, 21, 22, which is when the COVID measures are withdrawn. Next slide, Chris. So first thing to note, is that particularly once the COVID measures are withdrawn, the distributional impact of the, uh, the federal budget reforms concentrated principally in the personal uh, tax plan are very asymmetrically distributed. Um, it's only the top three deciles uh, of earnings where the benefits following uh, the, the, the withdrawal of COVID-19 uh, are maintained at around two and a half grand a year benefit compared with 2019-20. For the remainder of the earnings distribution, the benefits are small to vanishing. Clearly, the COVID-19 supplement has provided support across a broader range of the income distribution at levels of around uh, one and one, about 1,400 for, for those in the middle of the, uh, uh, the uh, earnings distribution. But those at the bottom, you can see, uh, once COVID-19 uh, supplements are removed, only 9% of the lowest tenth of workers will benefit in any way from the, the remaining measures. Next slide, Chris. There is a significant gendered impact also of the federal budget measures. What we sought to do is look at how the overall value of all of the tax reforms are distributed both across the earnings distribution and between men and women. Uh, the, blue, the blue bars here represent the, the share of the total value of the budget measures that accrue to men and the gold bars, the value that accrues to women. And the most immediate um, uh, observation that you can see here is that uh, men dominate in terms of the aggregated value of the budget measures, especially when you get to the top end of the earnings distribution when there are gender pay gaps and, uh, 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 um, amongst those uh, in the higher paid echelons. Next slide, Chris. There are also some significant discrepancies and differences according to, for example, labor market status. There's been a clear benefit to the unemployed from temporary COVID-19 supplements to job, keep, uh, job seeker, which were brought in in April of uh, this year, uh, with the average gain to the unemployed at around $5,300 per year in 2020-21 compared to 2019-20, bearing in mind that the supplements were brought in during the 2019-20 year and will disappear halfway through the 2020-21 year. But of course, if you then look a year ahead, you can see that there is a consequent loss of benefit to the unemployed, even compared with 2019-20, because 
uh, during 21-22, there is no measure to replace the COVID-19 supplements that are being withdrawn. So there's a real potential for a cliff to be fallen over there unless uh, uh, other measures are, are brought in in replacement. Next slide, Chris. And if you see how that translates to the distribution of gains and losses over the two financial years from now between, um, uh, according to family type, again, whilst in the next year support uh, is distributed more heavily towards singles and especially single parents who gain around about $2,800 a year in 2020-21 compared with the current financial year. Um, uh, when COVID-19 supplements disappear, single parents will lose on average around $1,000 compared with their circumstances now. So again, a real concern that these sorts of um, uh, COVID-19 supplements, once withdrawn, are going to uh, leave people, a lot of people, in quite difficult circumstances. Next slide, Chris. And just, just to translate what that um, cliff looks like, um, this chart effectively compares the value of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, job seeker payment in real terms, in gold here, with uh, a typical poverty line. Uh, the two dotted lines represent uh, BCC's own poverty measure compared with ACOS uh, poverty measure. So that translates to around $475 per week for a single person as uh, a reasonably authentic poverty line. Relative to that, the base job keeper you can see is flatlined at about 350 bucks. And so that's substantially below any reasonably judged poverty line. Clearly the COVID-19 supplement, as you can see in the gold uh, line, has brought temporarily those job seeker recipients to well above um, uh, the, the, the poverty line. However, if that disappears, then we're in the same circumstances we've been before. We recommend on this basis that uh, a lift in the base job seeker of at least $100 per week would be uh, the minimum required to keep job, job seeker recipients at or around the existing poverty line. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, um, Alan and Beck. As always, we really appreciate your insights and expertise. Uh, the gendered consequences of the pandemic and the COVID cliff that you've mentioned are certainly something that the sector has at the forefront of our collective minds. We might leave questions for the end and push on with the time, yep. and then we can um, again encourage anyone to pop questions in the chat that, um, that Beck and Alan can answer afterwards if we have time, and, and remembering that we can also forward any questions onto them. Okay, so our last presentation is from Chris Toomey, um, who most of you know, of course, the leader of policy and research at WACOS and has been since 2011. And indeed, the common denominator in WACOS's annual analysis of the WA state government budget and a level of um, experience on which we rely. Chris's presentation reflects a coordinated effort and the WACOS social policy team, I think, need to be really acknowledged for their extraordinary efforts in the last two days too. Over to you, Chris. Kaya, nala kaita chinunga mo, kaya nala kaita nanchi butcher. Just as you will have seen in the chat line, we're going to make the slides available afterwards. We've also developed a pile of fact sheets which will help you find all of the details. So when it comes to some of the breakdown, we're going to skip through the slides pretty quickly. Uh, in the time that we've got, I really wanted to follow on a couple of the kind of key points around what are the implications of the federal and state budget. As far as the federal budget narrative goes, you've heard the story about this being a historic moment, an unprecedented crisis, and that we're facing a once in a lifetime recession. And so in that context, you would think this would be a landmark budget. Certainly, we're looking at record numbers of Australians out of work, and those numbers are still predicted to grow in the immediate future. In delivering the budget, Josh Frydenberg said, this budget reflects our values. Our circumstances may have changed, but our values endure. He highlighted personal responsibility, reward for effort, and the power of aspiration. Um, and so when you actually look across the whole of the budget, it's clear that the bulk of the spending is targeting business investment. The bulk of the tax cuts, as, as Alan and Beth pointed out, are going to those on higher income. 
And with the pulling back of JobKeeper and the job seeker supplements, comparatively little will be directed to those who are struggling most and losing out. So it's very clear that the, the assumption under here is that economic recovery is going to rest on business and consumer confidence. But whether or not this is actually going to work with, with the um, spending that they put is a bit of a gamble. Certainly the budget is based on some pretty heroic assumptions about unemployment outcomes, about the, the bounce back in, in spending and consumer confidence, about containment of further outbreaks, when we're going to have an outbreak, vaccine when borders open up. And you'd have to say in international terms, Australia is doing comparatively okay, but our path to recovery is no means certain. So looking at the budget overall, it seems a shame to be committing over a trillion dollars in debt over forward estimates, so many resources to have a vision of our community and our future that is so lacklustre. Um, particularly where our concern is that what we could see emerging is a two-speed society. And as Bex pointed out, women have been missing out in this. And as we've raised in the past, we're particularly concerned about the impacts on young workers who are just entering the workforce as well, who could face a, a decade of career scar. So in summary, I'd say this is not a budget that seeks, seeks to grapple with the fault lines that have been exposed in the economy and community by the pandemic. It, in many ways, misses the opportunity to build, in, build back better and to be more inclusive in what they are doing. So, jumping through things quickly. Employment. Again, this narrative was jobs, 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 but really there wasn't that much spending that was actually targeted around creating jobs in specific economic opportunities or industries that we'd identified. It was very much a kind of scattergun approach. So we've highlighted a few of the details there around JobMaker um, and also the more money going into employment services. Um, ideally, we would have liked to have seen investment in job creation being more focused on long-term and sustainable gains. Um, Josh mentioned 20 or 30 times the word jobs, but at not one point did he say careers. So there was no focus on creating meaningful and sustainable work and rewarding careers into the future. And the bottom line is that, that business has been trusted to create close to a million jobs, but it's not entirely clear that the measures are well targeted to do that. A lot of the government funding is going to be in arrears. A lot of it is just general and generic. And there's big incentives for capital spending, which could actually be quite risky. So um, also income support, um, Alan and Beck already touched on this quite well. There are now 1.6 million people living off JobSeeker who are facing poverty in the immediate future. And there is an expectation that more people are going to be joining them for the first time. So this is why some of these issues are, are really critical and a lot of the numbers there are comparatively small compared to the threats. And we can see that there's a big push to put more money back into the cashless debit card. There were no numbers in the budget because that's going out to tender, but more money to continue existing place-based income management schemes and a large amount of money, which is around online infrastructure for delivering welfare payments. Um, affordable housing is another area where we're particularly concerned because with the combination of the hits to people's earnings and hours worked, we know that there's going to be pressure on affordable housing as people look to downshift and, and to find something that they can afford. So we're really concerned that we've got an emerging affordable rental crisis for people on, on low incomes and that there wasn't federal investment in social housing when there should have been. Um, I did want to highlight this for the sector. There, there were some federal announcements around that equal remuneration order. Um, the issue is that, that those go to Commonwealth direct funded, those through DSS, but in other places where they're national partnership agreements, like some of the housing and homelessness programs, um, there's still uncertainty around what's going to happen. Um, and look, we've included in the fact sheets in the next files where have been the specific announcements in children and family services, aged care, mental health, disabilities and Indigenous services. Um, 
the, the one thing that is worth highlighting that was a relatively big announcement is more home care packages and extra 23,000, which is a great thing, but that still leaves an estimated 60 to 80,000 more people who are already waiting for those services that won't be getting them in any immediate time. So let me jump through a few of the others. Again, there was announcement of a, of a number of mental health packages, um, some of that specifically for Victoria. And again, compared to the scale of overall spend, um, they're important, but they are by no means substantial. Um, also, some announcements around Indigenous services. Uh, again, um, some important stuff there, but, but not on huge scale. That $100 million is the last payout to um, Queensland, with the Commonwealth getting out of remote Indigenous housing. And as you will have seen in the state budget, the state has entirely picked up that funding in WA now. Ah, okay, so jumping forward. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, onto the state budget. Let me just find my place. So what does this unprecedented crisis mean for our state? By contrast to federal budget with a trillion bottom, bottom trillion dollar bottom line, get that right eventually, the WA budget actually posts a modest surplus. And that is when we're including 5.5 billion for the WA recovery plan and $27 billion investment into infrastructure. So um, there's a question as to, is it a good thing? Um, are we spending enough? Is there going to be a more demand in the next budget for us to be spending to cope with the impacts of the crisis. Um, part of the story as far as WA goes is that our resource economy is on the up of its usual boom buffs cycle and hence we've been buffered from the economic impacts of the recession to a large degree by the iron ore price in China. Um, revenue is down 1.7 billion this year um, due mostly to losing state taxes in the GST, but we're still doing pretty well. And our expenses are um, more or less comparable at 32.9 billion. Um, we are relying much more heavily on state revenue than we are on federal revenue. Um, and the growth in our expenditure has mostly been that 5.5 billion in the WA recovery plan. So I guess there are two key questions. What is the WA budget doing is it enough to stimulate and support recovery? And is that spending targeted to be effective and efficient to build back better and leave no one behind? Um, and in talking, the Premier highlighted four key things in the budget. Um, 27 million for infrastructure over four years, and part of that is bringing forward infrastructure investments they already had. The 5.5 billion WA recovery plan, the one-off $600 per household electricity credit by the Bell Resources payout, and then the recruitment of 800 additional police officers. And for us, it was a bit of a surprise that he chose that as the punchline to deliver in, in his announcement, and that that was something that, that he felt particularly proud of, which to us is a thing of great concern. So jumping into the slides, something, sorry, my computer has just, done something. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Household fees and charges. I'll skip over this because we've all already talked to it. Um, housing wanted to highlight a couple of things. The social housing recovery package is important investment. Um, we're glad to see that happening. It is comparatively small compared to the level of demand. Um, and, the, and, and particularly because of the concerns we now have about the pressure on affordable rental and the pressure we're going to see around homeless services, there's a question about how much more is actually needed to deal with those issues. Um, there has been, so the, the main response that the state government has had really about job creation has been framed very much more around uh, education and training rather than job creation. They have been doing a lot of stuff which has been about uh, free courses or reduced fees through the TAFE system, and that work has been targeted around those areas that are either important to COVID recovery 
or are addressing the needs of women and young people who have lost work during COVID. So that part of it is well targeted and, and, and so on. Um, disability funding, there is still a big number there and that is still about ongoing state service delivery, which is filling some of the gaps in the NGIS. Um, there is quite a list of Aboriginal services and initiatives. Um, these include some mental health and wellbeing ones, including youth and suicide prevention, some stuff into Aboriginal medical services. Um, there's some big numbers about the state picking up the Commonwealth responsibilities around maintaining housing and essential services in remote communities. Uh, and there's some other important things about short stay accommodation in Perth. There's also then a pile of individual bits and pieces that are spread out through the regional budgets as well. Uh, mental health services, oh, one of the numbers has disappeared there. Um, again, there have been a few announcements here, but if you will have um, seen the response from Karen Harvey and Wan, um, there's still very much both in mental health and other, alcohol and other drug services, a bit of disappointment that um, the new spending is very much going into the crisis and it's all been about creating beds. It hasn't been following the 10 year mental health and alcohol and other drug plan, investing in community prevention, community based services. Uh, it's still going in more beds and it's still not doing anything to reduce that growing demand on services. Family and domestic violence has been uh, a particular highlight issue. Um, there are a pile of bits, bits and pieces you can see going on here. Um, this is all important investment. Again, the numbers in comparison to the scale of the budget aren't huge, but um, it's good to see some of this stuff rolling out. Justice and corrective services, um, those numbers are much bigger. And um, again, like police recruitment, prison expansion, and some units in Bandy up as urina around mental health and alcohol and other drug prevention are a lot more money than what we're seeing into prevention and early intervention. Certainly there's some money for target 120, um, but you know, a quarter of the money for prevention and early intervention is going to PCYCs as well. Uh, and so I, I thought this was an interesting comparison. You can see how, how Lego policemen have changed and become more and more extreme <laughs> as time is going on, which, which is kind of reflecting a bit of what's happening to our society. Um, look, we've, we've got more detail about the regional investments. I'm not going to go into these now. There's significant overlap in these announcements and the state produced a whole pile of fact sheets region by region and media releases so you can go and find what is there in your region. These are a few of the, the cross-cutting ones that are particularly interesting. Um, children and young people. Again, what we've seen uh, in the top level numbers, there's a few small bits and pieces here. Um, there, there were some, over the last couple of years, we've seen some growth in the early intervention family support funding. But when you look out over forward estimates, the investment in prevention and early intervention is dropping while crisis services for children in state care, the costs continue to rise. And so you would think in this context, we would be seeing an investment more into those areas. You can also see there's some financial counselling money, there's some of the ERO supplementation that's rolling out for mental health through communities and for legal aid, that number seems to have dropped off the end then. Um, those are for those contracts prior to 2012. Look, um, it, so I'm not gonna go through the details of the WA recovery plan. I just thought it was kind of worth highlighting the kind of high vis cladding that we've been seeing here. Like uh, the majority of the measures that, that went in that were about uh, job creation were about building infrastructure and they were about construction through, you know, business as usual effectively. There were some efforts after the fact to try and put women into the, um, you know, picture as, as you see here and to, to offer some 
additional things around the edges for women and young people to encourage them into those industries. But what we haven't seen has been really that targeted investment into those places where um, people have actually lost jobs. What have we seen that's been targeting the skills and the aspirations that we know for people who've lost jobs in those, you know, hospitality and retail and tourism issues, where it's those human and social skills, so soft skills that have actually been more important. And the reason why this is a concern is that when we start looking through what's, what's in the recovery plan, the focus is very much into areas that are already in some ways overheating. There's a lot of money into infrastructure. Um, and so the real risk is that we end up with a two-speed economy. We're not targeting those people that need the help most. And some areas we're, we're actually then going to be faced with industry in some places is not going to be able to find workers and they're going to be complaining to say we're advertising and we can't get workers. At the same time, we're, we're seeing an, an increase in unemployment with people who don't have skills in those areas. So those are the big infrastructure numbers. And just let me get to the kind of final wrap up. So you'd have to say we now have the most popular state premier ever to look at the polls and a virtually non-existent state op opposition in the lead up to a March election. When the COVID crisis hit, we were buffered because we were on the upside of an ongoing boom and bust in the resources economy. We had luck and the nullabore on our side and quick border, border closures and the health response helped buffer us from the economic impacts of the pandemic. It's what the Premier described yesterday as us being an island within an island. Now that we've seen Morrison and Frydenberg splash out in a massive fashion with the federal budget, they've broken that debt and deficit disaster narrative and this, this focus on what good economic management means that has dominated the political budget cycle since John Howard. So WA Labor are in a position where they have the political capital and resources to do almost whatever they want. Um, and after this latest budget, it leaves us wondering, what is it that they actually want? What's it all for? What's, what's their vision of the future of the WA society, community and economy? Um, no one can argue that the Treasurer and Cabinet and the ERC have not been competent and disciplined in their management of the WA economy and the budget bottom line. You could say that the ship of state is being steered competently away from reefs and snags. The engine of state is humming in a way. We're all pretty much in ship shape condition. But you've got to ask, where are we actually heading? Where are we going to? Um, what's it all for? Where are we aiming for? We're at a historic and pivotal moment. Now would be the ideal chance for a Premier to step up with a vision of our future. It's, it's a light on the hill moment where we could be building a long-term vision of a sustainable and inclusive economy. And certainly, because of the crisis, we've seen a dramatic shift in community attitudes. Um, we've, we've seen a real, you know, everybody, uh, our friends and families, we've all been touched by someone who's lost their job or by the fear that, that we could lose our jobs and income into the future. Um, and so that hardening of attitudes we've seen since John Howard over the last couple of decades towards the disadvantaged and unemployed evaporated overnight. So we've got a community now who genuinely want to build back better and leave no one behind. We want a fair and sustainable future, one that is caring and green. Surely this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for a progressive government to do something aggressive. So um, I guess in closing my comments, um, my concern is that our recovery plan so far has, has been balanced. There's been some positive bits, but it's pretty much more of the same. It's kind of lacking in that vision and sparkle. Um, we need more job creation for women and young people who've lost jobs in tourism, hospitality and the arts, recognising their skills and aspirations. Um, not enough is targeted to those who are losing out. So on that point, yeah. I'll wrap up. Go Great. To questions. No, actually, thanks, Chris. Fantastic. Uh, we've well and truly gone over. Um, so I think what we will do, um, we've got a bunch of questions um, and comments in our chat. 
Um, and of course, it was always going to be ambitious to try and fit this into one hour with so much information. And, and, and a great to see the overlap in the themes um, across our um, presenters today. What we will do is um, send you the, uh, the fact sheets, we'll send you the link to the budget papers, and we'll send you the PowerPoint at the conclusion of this webinar. That will go some way to answering some of those questions. The other thing that we will do is um, pose those additional questions, which were quite a few were for Treasury, back to Treasury, and we'll circulate them amongst uh, webinar attendees. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, really great to have so many of you on and um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.